Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today is May 25th, 2021. As usual, when starting, most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for yet another opportunity of prayer. We thank you, God, for allowing us to see yet another day, oh God. We thank you, God, for one another. We thank you, God, for your love. We thank you, God, for your sacrifice, oh God. We thank you, God, for our family and friends. I thank you, God, for the viewers as well tonight, as well as I thank you for my guests, oh God. I ask you, God, that you will bless our conversation. Let it be insightful and helpful to your children and let them get the nourishing that they need throughout this broadcast. We ask these things in the mighty and master's name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Um, good evening, everyone. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to give a shout out to all of the born days that we celebrated this past week. You know, we had quite a few. We had quite a few. We had um start with my cousin Ev. Happy born day, Ev. You know what I mean? You're still looking young, bro. That's all that matters. Um to Narvis Green, uh Wanda Thomas, who's celebrating on today. Um countless, countless. I have mad friends that have birthdays this weekend. So I want to give everybody a happy born day shout out. Um but also my baby sister Taisa, who's celebrating her 40th form today. Happy born, Ty. I love you. Um, and again, to my son, who turned 25 on Sunday. Happy born, day, Mo. Daddy loves you, man. And for all you people that was had all the jokes talking about I'm getting old, I got something that all y'all can do for me, okay? But well, we're going to keep it polite. <laughs> like I said, I don't have no problem having a 25-year-old as long as I don't look like it. <laughs> I hang my hat on that. <laughs> and I want to I wanna say happy anniversary. The Bishop Carl and Angie Dixon celebrating their 36 years of marital bliss. Everybody else that's celebrating the anniversary this past week, um, happy anniversary to you guys, too. Keep on pushing. Keep on fighting. Keep on supporting one another. You know what I mean? Um, um, with that being said, I want to give um, my condolences to the family of the great, the late, great, legendary Paul Mooney. You know, man, thank you for sharing your gift, man. Thank you. Long live the spirit of Negro Domus. But he was just, I, I love Paul Mooney personally because not only was he funny, but he was cleverly funny. You know what I mean? And he wasn't scared to talk about the issues and the racial divide and things like that there, to put it in their face. No, I I'm going to say what I want to say because I have that right to say it and, and nobody's going to shut me up. So I, I, like, I loved him for the stand that he took. You know what I mean? Rest in peace to Paul Mooney. And also in the in the body of Christ, we we lost a true jewel. Um, you know, I I didn't have a personal relationship with her, but I, every time I would see her, she would greet me. How you doing, brother? And I remember one time she embraced me. She said, you "Need to embrace the call in your life. You need to embrace the call in your life because God is going to use you in a mighty and a powerful way for the demographic that He has for you to reach. Others won't be able to reach those same people. And I I thank her for those words. I thank her for her prayers." Thank her for the life that she lived. I thank her God most of all for her ministry, her giving herself back to Christ for the body of Christ. And that's none other than the late great Joyce Rogers. You will be genuinely missed. Uh, we thank you for all, all, all that you did and just being a true example. Um, and I also want to give a, uh, I want to ask solicit everyone on their prayers this evening for my family. Uh, my cousin, she lost a son, so I lost a cousin this week yesterday and you know we ask that you keep everybody and keep the family in your prayers as you you know those that believe in the power of prayer i ask you guys that you send up prayers of condolences and comfort during this time of mourning and remembering this young man's life i believe my cousin was like 25 he was young he was young he was a young guy going too soon man but we don't question god and we don't you know we know god don't make no mistakes so with that being said you know rest in peace cuz we love you. You will be missed. Um, and it's the anniversary, y'all. You know, I want to give my condolences again to the Floyd family. It's one year today since we've lost our brother. And I want to I want to put something out there to put in you guys' mind. The number 27. Remember that number, 27. Every time you think about George Floyd, I want you to remember the number 27. And what that represents is when you watch the video from start to finish, I know many people haven't because many people can't stomach it. I, um, I'm one of those people that don't like to watch stuff like that. I don't get into the whole underground thing like that, their roots and stuff. But I force myself to watch it because as painful as and hurtful as it is 
to to watch those things, I can only imagine how painful and hurtful it is to actually be experiencing it. So you you know what I mean, like to be the on the other end, on the receiving end of that violence. So it's like I, I kind of force myself to, so I don't, so it makes me hunger to go that much more. You know, like I said, this this man didn't lose his life. This man was murdered. And the, the number 27 represents how many times throughout the start of the video to the end of the video that this man kept telling these officers that I cannot breathe. I can't 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 breathe. 27 times throughout the course of that that video. Nine minutes in, throughout the course of nine minutes and 29 seconds. So I think it's I think it's kind of crazy that um here it is a year later. We still don't have any justice. I don't care anything about a conviction. I'm not satisfied until he's sitting in jail. You know what I mean? The officer, and I won't even say his name because I don't even want to give him that homage. But he know what he did. He showed no remorse for taking a life. And I, th I believe, I, was, I actually, in my personal opinion, I felt like the sentencing would have been totally appropriate for today. You know what I mean? It would have been great. I don't understand why we got to wait. Uh, it's a whole year later, and he's still sitting in jail waiting to be sentenced on, Jan on June 25th. I thought it would have been fitting if they had actually had that today, but we don't get to make that call. But um, with that being said, man, I mean, we could you kind of chime in on that there. I want to introduce my guest tonight. I got um old school brother, old school brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we go back to the St. Rocco days and playing ball <laughs> there. I met him through my man Ed, Ed Wilson. Shout out to Ed, who's been on the show several times. Um, my man Danny J, yo, this this is fam. This is fam right here. I love you to death, bro. It's been too long since we've seen each other, man. But I, I'm proud of you. I wanted when I created this show, you was one of the first people that I said I wanted to have on because where you come from, I know the struggle and what you're doing now, man, you're doing major things for the community, man. So introduce yourself to the people and tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, Marvin, thanks for having me, man. All I remember from St. Rocco was when that ball went down that hill. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to where they go get it. Um, and, you know, shout out and um, rest in power to all your family members that you, that you referenced, George Floyd, uh, condolences to his family. Uh, Paul Mooney, bro. I, I got to take it back to Paul Mooney for a second. Mm -hmm. If you haven't already, you talked about Negro Domus, but if you get a chance, listen to his two albums, Race and Masterpiece. Yes. He, he, was, he was really talking about race and racism and um, the things that we're dealing with today very early when it was unpopular. Ahead of his time. He was, he was ahead of his time. People would actually walk out of his shows because he made them feel so uncomfortable mm -hmm. telling his truth. Um, so rest in power to Paul Mooney. He inspired me on so many levels. His uh, was, was life changing and transformative. Uh, but I'm Danny Jean, Newark native, uh, work at Montclair State University as the assistant provost, uh, dedicated my life to Ephesians uh, 4 and 29, making sure all the words that I share are to build and not destroy. Um, disciple of KRS music, uh, edutainment. So I'm very into educating through the arts. Uh, finding creative ways to educate and empower folks and just very excited to be here. I use my social media platforms to help promote education formally and informally and really put folks in an opportunity and a mindset to help them understand that anything and everything is possible and they can truly reach and exceed their potential personally and professionally. No doubt, no doubt. That's good, bro. And, and so we could get there. Well, well actually, before we get, in, get into the the main part of the interview, like how, how did you feel being an educator, so to speak, um, having the ear of the youth in our society, you know what I'm saying, being a minister like you just told me, and seeing this whole thing unfold, this whole unrest in our nation. Like how did that how did that first personally affect you and how did how does it play a part in how you counsel and how you mentor? Some of the youth. Yeah, that's a good point. So I'm one of those folks who can't watch murders. So, right. So the, the murder of George Floyd, I've never watched it. Obviously, I know what happened. I'm aware that the trial's going on. But I think a lot of that stuff for me personally impacts my psyche. And it impacts the psyche of our youth. Right. So you, if you see this, um, and this is just one example of many, how can it impact your overall worth, um, your self-esteem, your value? 
So when I deal with my scholars, and they're all called scholars, not students, because they have the potential for greatness, I give them an opportunity and a space to share what they're going through, how they see the world. It's interesting. Remember when we were young, Mar, we were looking at the older folks, like they don't understand what we're going through. And I, I don't fully understand what a 17-year-old on 16th Avenue right now is going through. Yeah. I can give them an opportunity to let me know, like a space. What are you going through, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was the same connection we have with the older generation, but we're similar in terms of being in terms of the same hip hop generation. Yeah. So it's an opportunity where there's, there's a thread there where we understand to a certain degree, but we need to hear them to understand what their challenges are. So my scholars, I let them know immediately. I pinned a letter to them, letting them know that I was there for them, giving them a space to reach out to me. I can't fix this society, but I do want them to understand that they have an opportunity to, if they, if they make an observation, they have an obligation, right? So once you see things going on, what can you do in your local community to help change things? So protesting is one, voting is another, but there are other ways that you can empower yourself to try to challenge this system and make it work for you. So we give them that blueprint and that platform to really tap into their potential and figure out ways that they can ultimately help um, improve their quality of life in whatever way that is. Is that through education? Is that through protests? Is that through community organizing? We give them the, the opportunity to understand what their potential is to bring about true change. Gotcha. That's good, man. And, and, and kind of talk about that a little bit. So I see a lot of times you promoting. What, what exactly is it that you specifically do? What will be your... What will be a few of your many titles that you had? Uh, artivist, playwright. I'm an I'm a uh, I'm a retired rapper too, Marvin. I don't know if I was rhyming back. <laughs> in the day, I, I remember. <laughs> I still I still think my pink got bars. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I don't know about my flow now, but my you know I can write a rhyme. Um, and really, it's about educating, right? Whatever your platform is, how are you going to educate, edutain, empower folks to really understand? their potential, their identity, and their goals, right? So I have this whole movement, who got next? The whole idea behind it is once you reach the top, are you gonna send the elevator back down to those folks that come behind you? So I have the Richard Wilson, as you, you know Rich, yeah, uh, Rest in Power mentorship program, the Jason James mentorship program, two of my comrades who left the earth, who are now in the essence, eternal salute to them. But I have a free mentorship program where I work with folks of all ages to help folks reach their full personal professional potential as it relates to uh, being in the honor of my two brothers. So yeah. once you have these resources, once you have a little bit more, right? Cause I think you're down South now, right? So we're no longer, yeah, on, no on, Jav. We're no longer on South Orange Jab, right? And there's nothing wrong with being there, but we've, we've elevated, we got new opportunities, seen the world. How are we gonna give back to our community um, to make sure that they have those same opportunities and resources to achieve more? Okay. And while you went there, I was going to bring it up later on in the show, but since you went there already, you know, that's our connection. It's Ed. We met through Ed, my boy Ed. Yeah, shout out Dr. Ed, Wilson. big brother. Ed Wilson. Rest in peace, Rich, man. I kind of want you to talk about Rich a little bit, man. How, how important, you know, we were talking a little bit before the show started, man. You know, Rich was one of a kind, man. Like, there could never be, like, they, you know, like the old people used to say, you know, God broke the mold with certain people. He definitely broke the mold. With, with Rich. Rich was a one of a kind stand up guy. He loved hard. He let you know he loved you. You know what I mean? He was always down for you, man. How, what was the impact of, and it's, it's good to hear that you got a, a, a scholarship named after him, but what, what kind of impact did Rich have on your life? Man, Richard Wilson. I remember he told me, like, for like a year or two, he told me his name was Larry Livingston, and I believed it. Like, he, <laughs> he was just on another one, bro. Um, but uh, passionate, funny, creative. I got visions of him doing flips in Westside Park in the sandbox. Um, just a very unique man. man. We grew together. We loved together. Like we just went through so much as a as a as a family. I remember <laughs> we were walking through. And this is some of the, the stuff you got to deal with growing up. Uh, the way we grew up, walking through Westside Park, right, Marvin, in the car. Uh -huh. this. My brother starts to argue with the driver. The driver pulls out a knife on us like this. And I remember Rich or my brother said, run away. Like they, they literally said, run away. Like on some, we are gonna take off and run through Valesburg Park. Uh -huh. My brother first, cause he was the track star, Rich, Ed, and I'm like trying to catch up with all of them. <laughs> um, but it's like these moments we had growing up where it was just like, it didn't feel like survival. When you look back on it, it was. Mm -hmm. um, and Rich was just somebody who I always felt had my back in so many ways. Um, 
learn so much from him, man. Just a brilliant, brilliant, funny, charismatic individual that is sorely missed. And, um, you know, I just, I'm gonna make sure his name lives on through this mentorship program because he was- No really doubt, cool. man. Rich was, Rich was my guy, man. I remember me and Ed, me and Ed we kind of briefly talked about it a little bit one night, but actually we was over in Hawaii visiting Rich the night that we ran into Tupac. You know what I'm saying? And that was like crazy. Like it was just, it was just a rich moment. But I never forget, like you know, my one of my first jobs out of, in, in high school. We all worked at McDonald's together, and I remember <laughs> one day Rich was going off on me this particular Sunday morning. Like, man, you you messing up the program, man. He didn't school me on the program. But what it was was like, you know, the managers. I think the um the 24 only went up to East Orange at that time. You know, we was working at the Mickey D's right across the street from Turtleback Zoo. Mm -hmm, up mm -hmm. in West Orange. In West Orange, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was like, you know, on the 24 was stopped at a certain point. So the managers, if you was working that particular Sunday, the managers would have to come down to the bus stop to pick you up to bring you back to work. So we would try to time it to where they can't pick everybody up at once. They got to keep making these runs and stuff. <laughs> and Rich would just, <laughs> he ran the whole big dollars, bro. I mean, water fights. Just, just everything. It used to be crazy, man. We literally took over McDonald's while the managers was gone, man. But I really miss Rich, man, because he was all he was guaranteed for a good laugh. But like I said, the one thing that I respect about Rich, and I think it helped me get the way I am today, or having a relationship with him, kind of helped me be the way that I am today. Whereas the people that's in my life, I have no problem getting in that behind or telling you like it is. If you off that. Cause Rick was going, Rick, Rick was going, he wasn't going sugarcoat it. He was going to tell you exactly where you was messing up at, how you was messing up. And if you want to be a knucklehead, that's the right too. But there's so much more for you to do. You know what I'm saying? And I always loved and respected that about Rich because he never held no punches. He never treated me like, well, that's my brother's best friend. You know what I'm saying? He just took me in like a little brother too, man. And I mm -hmm. always appreciated that about Rich, man. I, I, it, it'll never be another one, man. It'll never be another one. Absolutely. And I worked at that McDonald's too. I might have been the plug. Imagine this. I lived in, I think on 18th Avenue in North. Okay. McDonald's right there. But you yeah. work at McDonald's, so you catching two buses to work at the McDonald's <laughs> in a whole other neighborhood because you don't want to see people, you don't want to see your people at McDonald's in the Yeah, yeah. Back then that wasn't cool. Like, ain't nobody want to be Calvin. <laughs> ain't nobody wants to be Calvin. And minimum wage, man. Minimum wage yeah. 335. And then it went to like 390. Then yeah, yeah, 335. And the crazy thing Long is, like you say, man, especially it's one thing to work at McDonald's, but you sure don't want to be working at McDonald's or A T Avenue. Yeah, man, man. good, man. good times, time, man. man. I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought up Rich, man. Rest in power, Rich. Rest yeah, no power, doubt, no doubt. Jason James. Yeah, man, we're gonna make sure their names live on, man. Absolutely. Got to, man. Got to. It lives on through us. Um, you brought up a good, interesting point too that a lot of people ask me about a lot of times, like. And I thought it was funny that you actually said that, but you talked about, you know, our experiences in North and how we didn't realize we was fighting for survival, but that's just exactly what it was. It was our norm. Like, how do you see the problems within today's generation? Like you said, the ones that actually do share with you, do they, do they, do they still have that mentality of, well, we're surviving, like we're, we're in this bubble or, is it just they taking life as it comes, so to speak? I think a lot of folks are taking life as, as it comes. Also, I think a lot of us, until you can see something different, whatever you see is just the norm, right? We grow up in communities where we're the numerical minor, a numerical majority. And then when we come off to college, where I'm mostly interacting with scholars, they become the numerical minority. So that's a shift, like, oh, snap. So everybody doesn't look like me. People eat different foods, cultures. And social media has kind of opened the world up too. So you don't, you're not necessarily seeing the bubble. Like we didn't see anything but South Orange Ave, 16th Ave, 14th mm -hmm. Ave. That's all we knew. That's all I knew. I hadn't been anywhere, no vacation, anything. Gotcha. Get to college, the world opens up. So for my scholars, I think that they, what I, what I love to see is the transformation. They kicking and screaming when, when the summer program starts. So the Educational Opportunity Fund, Fund Program is, is um, EOF. It's at uh, 60 plus schools in New Jersey. It's basically college access for low income scholars. So okay. you start school in the summer, you have a summer bridge program and then you get resources and support throughout your four years. So the transformation of my scholars in the summer program to graduating, bro, it's like, 
it's almost like they see the world completely differently and now they have the opportunity and the resources to make sure that the next generation of their family won't be eligible for the program because you have to have a, a certain low income criteria. And then they can just impact the world in the ways they want to impact. It. Like it's really important to just understand you have everything that you need in terms of a resource to help change the world and change your reality. And a lot of folks don't see that. They spend a lot of time focusing on weapons of mass distraction and getting caught up in people's highlights and not focusing on their own lives, mm -hmm. right? So we really try to help them understand their identity, their goals, and be very intentional with your decision-making as it relates to moving forward. And that's what it's about. So basically they understand once they finish our, our EOF program and graduate, we have our ceremony tomorrow night virtually, they know that they are part of AOF for life, but they also know that they have all the resources they need to do whatever they want to do in, in their life. And they have a family that they can always come back to and connect. But that's an important piece. Knowing, so when the older generation couldn't speak to us, what I realized what the threat is now with this generation is that they just want to be heard, valued, and seen. Mm -hmm. So if you show somebody, and, and some of it is, is indirect, um, is showing them that you really value them and care for them, then they'll come to you and stay connected. All my students are called scholars. So they already know from the beginning, I see them as scholars. It doesn't mean you had a 4.0 in high school. It means that if you're here, we believe you have the potential for the highest achievement and believing in them from the beginning. So none of that um, deficit-based language, at-risk populations, no. Yeah, you're first generation. You may be the first person to go to your college, but you're going to be a trailblazer and transform your life and then transform the lives of your family. I like that, man. That's good and powerful, man. Very powerful. Um, and how long has the EOF program been, been established? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's, it's actually been in existence since 1968. There's several wow. versions of it in different states, um, but it's a state funded program. So the state gives funding. Murphy's been a shout out to Governor Murphy in Jersey. He's given a lot of resources to our program. And basically you are able to fund the students to have a, a uh, a summer experience, and then you provide some support throughout their like staffing and academic support and financial support throughout their four years. It's an amazing right. program. It's one of the best kept secrets in New Jersey. And um, it's transformed thousands of lives over the course of the past 50 plus years. Okay. And what does it actually stand for? The Educational Opportunity Fund. Okay. Right. So All right. So, so y'all people that's out there that's still yeah. in Jersey, you got kids that's in high school and stuff, man. Look, look, look into it and get the research. Because one of the, that, that's another reason that I'm proud of you for doing all that you do. Because mm -hmm. I can honestly remember, like at Westside, bro, prime example. Like for me personally, I don't know about everybody else, but dude, I didn't when when somebody would ask me, you know, what 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 you want to be when you grow up, I had no idea. Like I used to just jokingly say a pimp because I loved Morris Day. I loved the way he dressed, I loved his style, you know what I'm saying? So I would jokingly say a pimp, but I would joke around with it for the simple fact that, dude, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know what an engineer was. I didn't know right. what a marine biologist was. I didn't right. know, you know what I mean? Up there, all we knew was teachers. You could be a teacher one day, or you could do this, or you could be a principal. Or, but I didn't know all these different career fields exist. I didn't know mm -hmm. I could excel at IBM or Blue Cross, or all these different big corporations. I had no idea even what to go to school for. So I think that is that's another factor that I'm real proud of you for, man, because I think it's important for us to get this information out there. You know what I mean? That you can go to school and become study horticulture and become a farmer and make millions of dollars just producing off your land if you work your land right. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Stuff like that. And we I, I had no idea of all these different things. And, and it took me traveling, getting older and seeing different right. experiences like. Man, I feel like I was robbed because, like you said, that older generation, they wasn't teaching us. You know what I mean? We came from the era where either you're going to go to school to be a teacher, going to school to play sports, or if not, you got, I don't know how many recruiters coming. I don't even know if they still do that. But I remember the Army recruiters, all of the military recruiters always coming down there. We all knew where a military recruiter office was at, but we didn't know about these different career paths that we could actually follow. We didn't know that we could be a lawyer. And, and to take it a step further, I can remember a time where I transitioned as I started getting older and you started to start getting your own awareness to where I remember like we, the Cosby show was the number one show in the country, hands down, not the number one at black or African American. So it was the number one show beating out Roseanne uh, Monday night. Like it had the biggest ratings of all time while it was on TV. 
But I remember it going from the transition of just becoming aware, get, get, getting aware, uh, gaining my own awareness that, hmm, this show is real funny, but if I got to pick and choose, and I, I think that's another thing that's that's wrong with our people too. We feel like we got to pick a side. We always got to, we can't just walk our lane. We got to pick a side. We either got to be for or against. And I remember started leaning toward more toward good times because that was more relatable. You know, seeing the projects and seeing the, the violence and all that kind of stuff there mixed with the humor, dirt poor. I'm like, man, and I started thinking about it. Like, when I ever seen a lawyer married to a doctor, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, living in a brownstone, like, that's not that's not fake. That just make believe, but not knowing at the time that that is possible. That is a real family somewhere where a doctor can marry a lawyer, you know what I mean, or vice versa. But at that time, based off of our surroundings, you know, uh, do it all, shout out to do it all. He talked about it last week, you know, we had that fishbowl mentality. That we're like, we're just worried about what's inside the tank. We don't realize that we're confined, you know, and there's a whole nother world outside of that fishbowl. So, you know, I think I, I, I take I take pride in knowing you. And like I said, if nobody else does, I definitely want to applaud you for putting that stuff type of stuff together and being a part of that program and making sure that the information gets out there. Now, once yeah, the information yeah. is out there and you don't use it, that's on you. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad to see that, you know, people like you, people of my age, not old people, are standing up and saying, no, you have alternatives. You do have options. You do have scholarship funds out here. There is money out here. to Because I'll never forget, Neil Pilato, a teacher told me one time, this was when I already graduated high school, right before I went to the airline industry. He said, listen, Mar, it's all kind of money out there. You just got to find out how to get it. He's like, there's money out there to go to school if you want to go to school. You just got to figure out how to mm-hmm. obtain it. So, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's not like where somebody just handed me that information. And I got to go do the research for myself. You're giving back. And I got I to gotta take my hat off to you for that, boy. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I remember you mentioned the Hawaii piece. I forgot about them buddy passes. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember Ed was going to Hawaii. I was like, you going to Hawaii? How are you pulling that off? Yeah, man, we was over there for two weeks, man. Two weeks. You know, it's funny you talk about Hawaii, I had a chance to go to Hawaii a few years back and I saw Kanye on the plane. Wow. And tried to give him a copy. You mentioned meeting Tupac. I met Kanye on the plane. And I saw this dude with a pink polo with his collar coming up, getting on the plane last. And I was I had my son in my hand. And I was like, nah. Because you remember Kanye had a real distinct look about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm going to the back of the plane. He went to the front of the plane, uh, direct flight from North to Hawaii. And I went to the front of the plane. I was like, yo, I'm about to see if I give him my book. You know, so I, so I went up to him. He was sleeping in the chair, right, Marvin? So I, I tapped him on the shoulder. He looks up like, yo, I'm asleep. <laughs> I was like, yo, my name Danny Jean. <laughs> my son right here. I'm the author of this book. Yo, no exaggeration. Yo, dude was like, I don't read books. I was like, I know, man, but I'm an author here. Just take this book, blah, blah, blah. I handed it to him. He probably left it on the play. And when you said you met Tupac in Hawaii, it just brought me back to what I met Kanye. And it's funny because when he said he doesn't read, and I just assumed he rejected it. I just took that as motivation. Um, it wasn't, you know, it's whatever. He Maybe he doesn't read. I interrupted his sleep. Mm-hmm. But I'm not looking at these folks as idols or anything. He's a great artist. Um, but him, his response to me just made me go even harder as it relates to my goals and aspirations. Like, okay, you may not want to hear what I got to say, but I absolutely have a vision and a mission, and it will get out there. Yeah, I like that, man. Shout out to the no reader Kanye. <laughs> How you gonna be a musical genius, but you don't read, man? Hey, man. <laughs> that mother was just trying man. to get some sleep, man. That's all that was. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible to be to get the way he got and can't read. You don't read. You know what yeah, I mean? You yeah, might not yeah, enjoy yeah. reading, but you read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't yeah, learn yeah. how to use all this program and software without reading. And shout out to to do it all. Um, I, I saw that interview with him. A part of it that was a good interview. Shout out to Red Man. Fuji's, um, Naughty, all these different folks that were local, Faith Evans, Three Doctors, like yeah. all these folks that were local that that you saw in the hood growing up, connected with them, and then see them reach these higher heights. They actually empowered and inspired me on a lot of levels. So shout out to all those locals who who did their thing and was able to share their voice through their art. Okay. I was watching and it inspired me to get to where I'm at now. All right, cool. We got a, we got a question from Rochelle on our views. Shout out to Rochelle. She said, um, I read that the governor of Texas wants to pass a bill to stop teaching slavery in schools. 
What are your thoughts on this? Thanks. Good question, Rochelle. Yeah, so a, a lot of what we're seeing is just um, the continued racism in this country, right? So George Floyd is one incident, um, them trying to stop teaching slavery or to stop trying to teach um, about race. It's all going back to the same ideology. Um, and I think we have to continuously fight. So for example, we know that the system doesn't necessarily speak to our experiences, right? The system was built when we were enslaved Africans mm -hmm. and it's the same system with Band-Aids on it. So ultimately it's, it's, it's actually, I've heard and read that it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do because it's supposed yeah. to, we're, we're supposed to be the permanent underclass. Absolutely. What we have to do is once we, and I said it earlier, once we make an observation, we have an obligation. A lot of times we're sitting here pointing at the people that live in Texas and say, what are they doing about it, right? Now, what are we doing about what we're hearing about the governor in Texas doing? We all have an obligation. So what can we do, right? We have to get involved, reach out to, and then it's not just happening in Texas, but you reach out to the local organizers in Texas to find out what can be done. And then we challenge these racist practices. Like think about what the GOP is doing about voter suppression, like we, we have to make sure we're challenging if we're gonna operate within this system. And we also have a choice to leave the country, but if we're gonna operate in this system, we have to challenge and be aware and mindful. So are we gonna spend mindless hours on social media? Or are we gonna be watching these politicians and holding them accountable and make sure we're electing folks who actually have our best interests in mind? Um, so my answer to that is we have to get involved. So if that bothers you, um, the, the, the viewer who has a concern about it, my question to you is what are you going to do about it, right? If it's something that concerns you and we all have our things that concern us, how can you get involved on the ground level to help bring about true change? We can't do it all, but we can all do something. Yeah, shout out to Jennifer too, checking in. Jennifer said that the governor of Texas is doing a lot of things that I'm against. That's why I'm leaving. <laughs> you said she getting no part of it. Well, that's what I mean too. You also can leave, you have a choice, yeah. right? free will. Yeah. If you're gonna stay there or if you're watching it from afar, how can you get involved? How can you make sure that those folks in Texas are aware and empowered to try mm -hmm. to fight any of that legislation and those rules they may try to bring about? We mm -hmm. all have an obligation. We can't just look to whoever it is and assume that they're gonna bring about the change. Okay. I like that. And I did, I wrote that down. Say that for me one more time. Once you have an observation, you have an op obligation. Yes, I, I think MK Asante said it, said it first. If once okay. you make an observation, you you have an obligation. I like that. That's 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 a book in itself. That that says a lot. It speaks volumes. Just that statement alone. Absolutely. Um, I was I was looking through some of your posts, and I remember seeing one with you with the Haitian flag. So I say, um, <laughs> no, so it says, uh, remind reminded that the bloodline has that my bloodline has overcome insurmountable obstacles. Talk about that a little bit. How, how, how important is being of Haitian descent to you? So um, Haitian revolutionaries um, led Haiti to be the first free black republic in the Western hemisphere. And as a result, uh, the powers that be have suppressed our country. And that's why we're the poorest country in the Western hemisphere, right? So there's a price for your freedom. But ultimately the bloodline of Toussaint L'Overture and Jean-Jacques de Dessalines, who basically overcame the French government and, uh, from 1791 to 1804, basically is in my bloodlines, meaning that if they, in that circumstance, could lead a revolution in the mountains to take over that country, create a new flag, a new constitution. So Toussaint L'Overture is my George Washington, right? So he brought about change in that country that still motivates and inspires me to this day. So how can I be you know, here with these resources in Jersey and complain about what I have when I have so much more than the generation before me had. And with all of these resources in my hand, once again, what am I going to do that's gonna help bring about a better reality for my children, your children, and the world as a whole? You know, and we all have that piece. I'm an educator, so I have a forum, but I'm doing a lot of things outside of my professional role. Like for example, social media, like how, how can we, even this interview, right? The interview with Doodle, I watch that. Like it's, it's, it's inspiring to hear um, what people are doing. So I'm promoting future doctors on my website. I'm promoting, I just posted a job position. I posted 
resources. I have free mentor services, like really just helping folks understand therapy. Like I promote the, you know, using therapy to help get your mind right. Um, it's really important. You made, you said that earlier. I don't know if we said it offline. Folks really understanding, like, in other words, I might be going through something, Marvin, that you're not aware of. And then when I share it with you, mm -hmm. it makes you more open to that potential resource. Yeah. Let's think about therapy. What was the stigma on therapy when we were growing up? Man, mm -hmm. I'm in therapy every week. It's a blessing to have benefits where I can have therapy every week to help kind of sort all of these things that are happening in this world. So yeah, um, the Haitian bloodline is thick. Shout out to Wyclef, who threw the flag on, I think, in 1996. Um, we talked earlier offline about how Haitians were treated, uh, Haitian body odor, African booty scratches, yeah. all this drama, and all of that is built on self-hate. But it was a lot of hatred for Haitians, and folks were um, not wanting to rep that flag. But watching Wyclef pull it out and really let the world know our power just reminded me of that bloodline that I mentioned. And I, and I literally throw the flag on at every graduation. I keep a flag in my pocket. My flag is a little bit out of arms reach. I got one right there. All right. Um, and it's just to promote how strong our country is. I don't care how poor we are. We still have our pride and our dignity. Yeah. And we literally uh, led the, the, one of the largest slave revolts in the history of the world. Man, that's, that's, that's some good stuff. I got to do, do some justice myself as far, as far as studying up on the history of Haiti. And how they came, you know, how they came to be and overthrow because it's a it's a powerful thing. And it's like you say, of course, no nobody wants to live in poverty, but man, listen, the the pride and the and the the, the level of freedom, you know what I mean? Free, and that's the thing people don't understand that you know over here in America, land of the free, home of the brave. Listen, freedom is not free. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, you got you got to pay for the cost of freedom. You know, and, and I think that's what they do is our government, they play on our fears all the time. I tell people all the time, I don't care what you want to say, and I ain't about to debate it, but you know, say we're flying today in 2021 than you was in 2011 before those towers got hit. You are no safer. But they, the way they try to program you to think that, okay, yeah, now all of a sudden I don't have no problem with throwing a, 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 my bottle of water away, and I'll pay $5 for a bottle of water once I get a call checkpoint. We don't see that it's all smoking. We don't see the big picture. You know what I mean? They they plan on your freedoms and everybody, even with the vaccines now. Well, if they say, <laughs> you know what I mean, that I need to get vaccinated and it's gonna help me live, you know what I mean? Then so be it. Let me let me go ahead and get vaccinated, even though I don't really know what it is or what. It, and, and I and I see I see that, and I'm I'm not even gonna get into that debate tonight either. But you know, the, what the vaccinate whether or not, you know what I mean. I stand on my beliefs. I respect everybody's choice for what they, they consider to be best for them. But my thing is, you know, I see people all the time say, well, you know, I, 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 I done done thorough research. I done done thorough, thorough research on this vaccine. And my question is, how much thorough research could you have done on a vaccine that's been developed within the last two years for a disease that was just was with that came within the last two years that nobody ever heard of before. We've never seen a global pandemic like this before where it's killing people everywhere. Not people down south, not people in America, but across the whole wide world. And within a year's time, I understand that technology is great and all this kind of stuff here. But you mean to tell me you got a vaccine within a year and a half? Uh-uh, I'm good. You could miss me with that. They're not putting that stuff in me. You know what I mean? That's just That's just my opinion. But I don't understand, like yeah. I said, I think sometimes some of the thought process we have, we would challenge ourselves and we would just say things out loud. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, the only thing I'll add is, it's interesting you say that, because for one, even when you try to educate yourself, they set it up now to where they're, they're, they're organizing all of the resources. So for example, exactly. you're, you're researching the propaganda <laughs> they're feeding you. Mm -hmm. um, to taking the vaccine is a choice. I know people who are, who have died, so mm -hmm. it's so it's a real thing. But you still yeah. have to do what you believe is best for you, as it relates to the safety of you and your loved ones. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's yeah, man. I I think it's a matrix. I think we all have to try to pull away from it. Um, the addiction to the screens, I think, increased over the past year since the you know the murder of George Floyd mm -hmm. and the pandemic as a whole. Um, we really got to just pause and truly kind of understand our purpose, our passion, and our why. Like, why are we here? 
So, you know, I have the I Am My Well book, right? So I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about it. I Am mm-hmm. so I'm not sure if you can see okay. it a little bit, a bit. But the idea behind it is I am who you are and who you are not. Like you're owning your identity. You're not letting society tell you who you are. You're creating your identity. And then the I will is what do you plan to accomplish? But the thread of that, Marvin, is what is the why power? So I am Danny Jean. I will um, stop eating sugar, right? Why? Because diabetes runs in my family. I am Danny Jean. I will change my diet. Why? Because hypertension and, and, and blood pressure, high blood pressure runs in my family. Like, and if that why is not important enough, you're not going to have the discipline to achieve that goal. Mm-hmm. If it is important enough, then you will make the change. I will become a nurse. I will graduate from college. Why? Because I'm the first person in my family to go to college. My mother worked mopping floors at College of St. Elizabeth. So I'm going to do what I have to do to make sure that she doesn't have to do that anymore. So really understanding the purpose of why we're here, not letting that matrix dictate your actions. And to your point, the government, the fear and the the, um, retail therapy and uh, the unhealthy eating, all of that is being triggered by your anxiety and your depression. I read this quote one time that talked about if you're stuck in the past, you're focused on depressive thoughts, right? And if you're stuck in the future, you're focused on, the. if you you have anxiety, you kind of focus on the future. How can you lock into this present moment? Who are you? What are your needs? What are your challenges? Why are you happy? Why aren't you happy? Like really dialing into the moment of why and where you are and then being very intentional with your choices moving forward to get to where you need to go. That's that's, that's like a simple blueprint that goes beyond this matrix. So you can watch these propaganda videos and get caught up in all of that, but you have to make your own decisions on your life, your own choices. And ultimately you're going to have to live with those choices. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's good stuff, man. I like that. Um, all right. So let me ask you this real quick. What, what, uh, why is it that education is so important to Danny? Well, for one, everybody you meet knows something that you don't. Everybody. So even beyond the formal education, formal education is important, but it's expensive. So I, I, yeah, I push formal education. I do believe in it. If you really subscribe to it, you can get out resources. But the reality is one out of two graduates are underemployed. So folks are graduating with college degrees, but still can't find the jobs in their careers because they're not really tapping into their purpose. So if you tap into your purpose, for example, Marvin, if you tap into your purpose and your purpose is not a a college, is um, um, a goal that is not connected to a college path, then you don't go to college. Mm -hmm. And that's just straight up. Just figure out what you're going to do to get you to that goal. But if you're just wandering and you don't have a path, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But if you have a pathway and college is part of that path where you want to become a doctor, engineer. There's some formal education needed for that. If you want to start your own, and the part of it is, so the formal education is cool, but what are you going to do to supplement it to actually, there's so many, it's too many resources now for you not to be able to self-teach yourself anything, right? So how can you formally educate yourself? If you want to start your own business, it's almost like if you can't find a job, create one, period. Yeah. And, and, that, and I know that might sound simplifying it, Mm-hmm. But if you can spend 10 hours on Netflix, 10 hours on YouTube, 10 hours on social media, that scrolling and liking and getting stuck, like they literally, you know, they created all of these things with addictive properties. Mm-hmm. So you see that notification, it literally does something to you that you need to see what that notification is. This is not, this is man-made technology to basically buy your attention so they can sell you products. Mm-hmm. So you under, again, that's what I mean about being present in the moment. I deleted a lot of the social media off my phone because I found myself tapping it too much, right? So I can get to my social media. Yeah, it's communication, but can you use it as a tool and not a toy? Absolutely. You could run your own business. You could start everything through your phone. You don't have to sit mm-hmm. and watch highlights of a, watch a three hour game and then watch another hour of highlights. Are you going to live your dreams or watch somebody else live theirs? Period. So it's like just really just plugging into who you are and tapping into your purpose. And that's when you can find out what educational path is best for you. It's not, college is great. It's not the only option. What is your end goal and what will get you to your end goal, period. Man, that's powerful and interesting. And I believe that's that's the God divine that you would go that direction because I was literally having a conversation with somebody this time yesterday. This time yesterday evening, I was having a conversation with somebody about how the devil is the prince of the air. You know, when you talk about air, you talk about air, you're talking about the airwaves. What is the internet? 
what is television? So the whole time that we're supposed to be here in this, first of all, our spirit man, I'm not about to preach, but our spirit man is what lives forever. This body is going to die. This person that right. you're looking at right now is going to die. Correct. But my spirit will live forever. So why am I not trying to achieve that instead of going to the gym every day? Not saying that anything is wrong with working out. You know what I mean? But why am I not trying to build my spiritual man for it to be prepared for eternity versus trying to satisfy my needs in this earth here where I know I'm going to die? You see what I'm saying? So that's that, that's a trick of the enemy. That I, to, he's a master of deception. So what I'm, what my point is, like you said, an hour that you could be, we want to we want to catch up on power. You know what I mean? We want to we want to see this here. We want to do this here. You go how many times you go on YouTube just to watch one thing, and before you know it, it's four hours later, and you still there. Whereas opposed, let's say that particular time, God just wanted you in the Word, or to watch some uh, watch something of Him, and He just something that you've been struggling with for years now. The answer is provided in there, but you're so distracted, like you said. You know what I mean? Based off the things that doesn't matter whatsoever, that right. we're missing the, the big point, or we're missing golden opportunities because we can't get time back. All we can do is work on, like you said, what who I am now and what is it that I want to accomplish. So I try to tell, I try that's 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 I think that's part of my personal ministry. And I don't fault preachers that don't promote that or whatever because everybody has a different call, everybody has a different ministry. But I think it's really important for us to put focus on people developing a, first of all, a relationship with God Almighty through Christ Jesus. And second of all, on top of that, preparing your spiritual man for eternity. You know what I mean? Who can, can you imagine going, making it to heaven? You know, some people just say, I just, as long as I make it, I'm good. But I don't want to be, I don't want to get to heaven and I'm looking like a bum considered in my new body or on the lower class of there because I didn't build my spiritual man up. So I'm just the most basic spiritual being in heaven <laughs> you know what i mean when i could have did the, so many things to prepare myself for eternity you know what i mean mm -hmm. so I, I think that you know i think it's real important that we you know we promote stuff like that there Edu like you said education is fine every education is is, is 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 a beautiful thing if used the proper way and i'm glad that you said that because i wish i had an adult tell me that <laughs> you know 20 years ago because i never wanted to go to college to be honest with you you know what I'm saying? I just wanted to go to college because I wanted to be the first one in my family to go to college. You know, I got two younger brothers, so I wanted to set an example. Why is that? That's because that's what everybody was trying to program me to think and want me to do. But I was terrified of going to college for the simple fact that I know, you know, I would see Ed. I would go visit Ramapo with Ed where he was shot out to Ramapo. Ed up there, he was the, R what did they call it, the RAs when you run the four or whatever. You know what I mean? So I would go up, chill, go up there and chill with Ed, you know what I mean? I tell people all the time, the only that time I've been to a college campus was the party or for a football game or something like that did. You know what I'm saying? But it, it showed me, like, hold up, man. First of all, you ain't got no teachers making you do nothing. You got to go to class because you want to go to class. And here it is. I was. It's nothing that I'm proud of. But I think that a lot of my, my, my schoolings or my circumstance made me fear college. Because you're looking at somebody. I went through four years. I got my diploma. I walked on time and all that good stuff. But I went through four years of high school, Danny, without ever doing a term paper before. Because, because of my athletic ability, anytime I was scared to take a test or something like that, did Marvin Bennett, please report to the new gym. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm chilling down there with my coach. I didn't have to do all the other kind of stuff. So when I got ready to go to college and I'm filling out these applications and they asking me all these questions, I'm like, man, I got to do this on an everyday basis. I got to do term papers and talk about this here and that thing. I got to talk about my feelings. Nah, that ain't where we come from. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I was. I wish I had had somebody though at the same time to tell me, no, well, if college isn't for you and the military isn't for you, you could go to trade school. You could develop, a, you know what yeah. I mean, all these different things and still become an entrepreneur and take care of your family or whatnot. So yeah. I think, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of you because you're, you're you, not man. just talking about it or you don't just have the, the knowledge. I think that was real powerful what you were talking about. I don't know if that was off the air or on this show or a little earlier in the show. But when you were talking about uh, when you were in that elevator, making sure you reach back down. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think that I don't think that is is enough for you to become 
be a a, a, a Howard student, become an intern at Uptown, like Puffy, create your own entity and become a mogul, and don't show nobody that blueprint. Because yeah. what do you have to lose? Guess what? There's not going to be another 100,000 billionaires. You know what I'm saying? But that doesn't mean that you don't give the information back on how you got to where you are. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Each one teach one. Um, you know, it truly takes a village and understanding the importance of the village. We had a village, mm -hmm. um, you know, and everyone has a, somewhat of a village, right? You may not have a nuclear family, but you have a village. And you just got to take advantage of the resources and really put yourself in a position to help others, man. And I, I just appreciate this platform and this opportunity to have a such a varied conversation on all these different topics because, you know, for one, hopefully folks can be empowered and inspired by some of the things we're talking about. But I just never want to lose sight of how important it is that everybody has the opportunity to do amazing things. Mm -hmm. Like folks get caught up seeing their favorite rapper or their favorite entertainer or their favorite educator and just assume they can't reach those heights. Yeah, but you have your own path. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to like, okay, the younger kids may not understand what they want to do in life. They have instruments in college. They, I don't know if they focus on in the high school that allows you to really tap into what your strengths are. So if you work well with your hands, it'd be like, well, these might be the pathways. There's also a website called the Occupational Handbook where you can look up any trade, any profession, and it gives you the, the job outlook, which has probably changed over the course of the past year, uh, how much you can make, the training needed, and the different positions that are related to that area. Like for example, I wanted to be an educator, Marvin. I initially thought I wanted to be a classroom teacher because that's all I knew. Then I wanted to be a college professor because that was like, okay, well, I'll be the teacher on a college level, not realizing that you could be an AOS director, you could be a counselor, you could be a mentor, like it's other ways you can educate, which probably suits me better because I don't like the parameters of these different these different programs. I'm a I'm an artist. Yeah, so you don't want to be boxed in. Yeah, I want to be creative with it. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's good to do what I do in higher education because there is structure, but there's room for me to add my own creativity and bring in motivational speakers and bring in and create leadership programs and financial literacy and career development, like the things you actually need in life. Mm -hmm. So you can actually leave with a certain skill set that actually is, is fruitful and powerful for your own development and growth. So if college, if you can create, go to college and have all of those opportunities and experiences, and you can leave with something, you'll leave with some loans, but you'll leave with something that's actually tangible for you, for your major, your career path, but also you personally. That's what happened to me. I had a 1.9 GPA in high school, lost my father when I was 13. We lived on Grove Street right off 18th Avenue. You know, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I went to university high school. I just kind of just wandered through high. You talk about not writing the paper. I had papers that I wrote, but I wasn't never challenged. But university high school was supposed to be one of those magnet schools. Yeah. Time, right. So we were supposed to be the cream of the crop. Man, I got the mm -hmm. college. College professor wrote, stop trying to sound more intelligent than you are in my first class. Like wow. it, it was a culture shock. Like it's all black in, in Puerto Rican and in North. And now I'm the only black male in the class feeling like I'm representing every black man on the planet in that particular space. But the EOF program that I was a part of gave me a counselor resources. So to even be the, the director of a program that actually gave me the, the pathway to college is a blessing and, a, and, a, and, and Tank went through it and Ed went through it. We all went to Ramapo together. They must've did really, they must've, Ramapo must've really did some really good recruiting in Newark. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Elman Newman, shout out to Fred Newman. They, they tapped into all these schools and gave all of us Brick City kids a chance. And we haven't looked back since. Yeah. Shout out to James Davis, too. James was up shout there. Out James. Shout, shout out to James. Shout out to James, man. That's what and I that, 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 up, that James. That was the thing, like, you know, I know mad people, like, if they wasn't going to, like, D1 or whatever, like, a lot of guys cats on the football team. Hey, I'm going to Ramapo. Yeah. I'm going to Ramapo. And until Ed, I had never heard of Ramapo until Ed. And then I didn't even know where it was at. So I remember coming up there and I was like, yo, it's kind of high. And I actually got to go. I was like, I don't need it. And teacher not going to ask me for no ideas or nothing. I actually went to Ed with a class with Ed one time. Then I sit in. It's like, yo, this is kind of next level. But then when I got the job at the airport and started flying, it was like. But that, that was life changing too, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, my God. I got to go to some amazing places. And I try to tell people, you know, people say, well, you got. You're so insightful. You know, people are different backgrounds. You can have a conversation with anybody. I hear stuff like that all the time. But that's where I got that from because I would travel. You know what I mean? I would go I would go down to Florida just because it was snowing in Jersey, and I ain't feel like sitting being in no snow. I'll go down to Florida for the day and come right back the same day. You know what I mean? 
I remember me and my man Bell at one point, we was going to Vegas two or three times a week just for the night. You know what I mean? We catch that red eye fly, come back the next day. You know what I mean? So I got to see the world. I got to do some traveling outside the world. And, you know, one of the things that I tell people all the time is, and I thank God for ministry because I, I lived in Little Rock, Arkansas for eight years and was actually doing ministry out there. But I, I, I learned from that experience was we all pretty much the same. Black, white, and difference. We all pretty much the same. We do the same things. We just go about doing them differently. <laughs> you know what I mean? What I mean by that is we we love our up in Jersey. We in the backyard somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Out here, they up down in the south, they out front. You know what I mean? Or mm-hmm. they at the pool side, or they make sure they got it. You know what I mean? We all doing the same thing. We about our family. We about our loved ones. And we about our community at the end of the day. So I wouldn't have been exposed to that if I had never been outside of North though. You see what I'm saying? So going to these different places, going to Washington, going to Utah, and just all these places for no reason, not having no reason to go, but just to see how other, the other side lives. Just getting expo- yeah. exposure is an educational process in itself to me. Absolutely. You know what I mean? The more and more that you can expose yourself to, the more that you have access to and knowledge. Because I try to say, I used to tell people all the time, you could take two boys from the hood and you could take two country boys and put stand them together. And guess what? They might be survived, but you're going to get a whole lot. You're going to get a whole lot farther if you take a, a city boy and a country boy and them two are stuck together. Because a country boy got a whole way of different th- way of thinking than a city boy got. Absolutely. So y'all get to come together and formulate ideas. And I think you're going to have more productivity because of the diverse backgrounds. You know what I mean? I, I agree, man. Absolutely. And that, that's what I meant about every person you meet knows something that you don't. Mm-hmm. Different places. I mean, in, in Hawaii, remember spam? Spam was everything. Spam is on the <laughs> menu, right? And then yeah. the history of how spam was imported to that area, I think in the 50s. So it's like you just learn and see different things, and it just opens you up to like when I went to Hawaii and they, they gave me the lay, I believe it's called when you first yeah, lay. The plane. Like it just was a it was I was looking at the fresh flowers, it just put me in a whole different mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm hoping to again to, and I do a lot of traveling. I do uh, professional speaking across the country too. So hopefully, now that the world's opening up, I can get back and travel because I used to go to these different places and just meet different people. And it's just life changing to be able to grow and learn um, as you relate and connect with others. What is that like, man? You said you had a 1.9 GPA. How 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 does how does that feel to be able to go from the same kid, university, high school, 1.9? to being a keynote speaker at an institution like an MIT. Yeah, so it's interesting. I'm, I'm, uh, I got invited back to talk at, to the university. I'm the commissioner speaker for university this, this, this season. So that's like full circle for me. 29 yeah. years later, I'm going back when I was like in the last five people in my class. Marvin, what it was for me was father dying in high school. And that's why I, when I think about the drama and trauma my scholars go through, that's why it's important for them to understand. I have this mantra, you are not alone. Mm-hmm. So I do this presentation where I keep drilling that into the students. I'm like, if you were homeless, I moved over 12 times when I was in high school and I was homeless at one point. So I say, if you were homeless, you were not alone. You know, losing loved ones to street violence and all of that stuff or suffering from the loss of loved ones. If you lost loved ones, you were not alone. If you had teachers tell you that you would never amount to anything, you were not alone. If you got drug, you know, uh, drug abusers and drug dealers in your family, you were not alone. If you got, you know, if you were on welfare, you were not alone. If you were ostracized or marginalized because of your intellect or called corny because you were smart and you had to dumb it down for the people around you, you were not alone. So I just frame it to these to these folks that are um, in college to really help them understand that, yeah, these are your trials and tribulations, but do you want more? And if you want more, what steps are you going to take? That's what I meant about the why. Why do you want more? I want more because I've, you know, I had the 1.9 GPA, I suffered. So I was always smart, but I didn't apply myself. Like we joked earlier about, you know, straying away from, from that, 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 that um, spiritual foundation that we both received. I'm a preacher's son. You know, my father was a minister. I knew better. I know right from wrong. I know what a good choice is. I know what God's, the power of God is, but it took me having to go through these trials and tribulations to get back to that foundation to really focus on what's important and make those choices. It's like, listen to the inner voice before you make that next choice, mm-hmm. right? And then really understanding how you gotta be mindful of what you eat, what you think, 
um, and um, just how you move as it relates to what you want to achieve in life. Gotcha. Now you, I'm glad you went there. Well, how how does your, your your faith? How does your relationship with God? How does that impact your daily lifestyle? What it is that Danny wants to do? What Danny wants to accomplish? You know, it's interesting. I, I really, I'm, I'm the the pandemic and everybody who's watching. Just just pause for a second and think about what did what did the pandemic teach you? So what the pandemic taught me, Marvin, I would love to hear what it taught you was all these things that I'm stressing about don't matter. It's health, family, spirituality, right? So yeah, obviously you gotta have, uh, uh, you gotta be gainfully employed, you gotta have resources. But if you have, if you have health with all these people who are sick and who are dying, you are blessed. If you have family, whatever that family is, nuclear family, um, whatever family you've created, your circle of influence. I think Nipsey Hussle said, if, if your circle of friends don't inspire you, they're not a circle, they are a cage. Mm -hmm. Do you have a circle of influence who can really help keep you in a proper mindset? And then the spirituality is slow down. And how can you reconnect with a higher being, the higher power, you know, um, prayer, meditation, um, reading the Bible, uh, you know, doing like just really locking into what's important. So I focus on family more than I've ever done because I've never been able to slow down like this before. I'm actually trying to make certain that once we reopen fully, Marvin, am I going to still stay locked in Here you to go. This mindset? Yeah. You know, I have a mindset now, like my diet is great. I'm back to, I'm lower than my, the weight I was before, before the pandemic. I'm eating right again, staying away from the poisons in my body, focusing on family first. Like I'm really locked into that. Um, and then that, you know, and just trying to pray as much as I can and, and reconnecting with the higher being because, those are the, that's the foundation you need. You can stray away from it, but if you are healthy, if you are spiritually grounded, if you can connect with your family, you are a blessed individual. And as you said before, we all live to die. Like nothing's, nothing, we can't escape that fate. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do while we have this time on earth to really have a, a, a healthy existence as it relates to what you're seeing in this world? And it's almost like this, and I've always shared this in my presentation. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond, right? So it's like, remember how we probably were easily triggered back in the day and you get a little older now and you have a little bit more discernment. So you're a little bit more conscious of decisions and all of the different decisions you made back in the day that could have literally put you in the grave. Mm -hmm. And it's simple, not even like, yeah. you know, like, like, you know, you anything, right? Going to the party that you knew the thing was going to yeah. jump off. Right, something as simple as that. So we're blessed, mm -hmm. right? And, and you've lost loved ones, I'm sure, over the past year. We've seen lost loved ones. So we, we just gotta be mindful of how blessed we are and not lose sight of it and live according to a, like a blessed life. If you really understand you're blessed, blessed, your decisions will be blessings to others. But you will understand that you're not here just wandering. You actually have a purpose. And how can you illuminate God's love? How can you really stay grounded and impact the lives of others in whatever ways you can. And that could be your family, that could be through work, that could be through ministry, whatever it is. I always joke that I'm, you know, I never thought I would be a preacher, but I have this ministry now, right? That I do, that I use this platform to really educate and empower folks. So when I get feedback from people saying they're, they're inspired by a post or a speech or anything, that motivates me to continue to do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And your work is important, Marvin. I didn't even realize you had this spiritual foundation. Like I knew, you know, I knew about the connection with Ed and that such, but I never knew you were that spiritually connected. So even this conversation is going to get me closer to God or remind me my relationship with God. So I thank you for that. But what right. did you learn during the pandemic? Man, okay, so uh, Rochelle said it increased my faith in Christ. I, and I'm kind of the same way as you, bro. I, um, For me, one of the things that the pandemic taught me most of all was, hey, listen, and, you know, I see it all the time and I don't knock it. I get it. I get the whole concept, you know, family first, family first and all that did. I disagree with that statement, though, because family will always be a strong second. There's no 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 relationship that you can have that's more important than your relationship with God. You know, that's first and foremost to me, because that is the center. That is that that's where everything starts and, and begins. I never forget seeing one time and I've always felt that way, but it felt good to hear somebody that I respect and like to say the same exact thing. DMX said it though. He said, you know, from the time that we're born, 
we're learning how to die. You know, people don't normally think about it like that there, but every day that we wake up that God allows us to see another day, we are literally closer to death than we are to than the beginning. You know what I mean? So again, it taught me, for me personally, to do some self-evaluation. Like you say, the gift, the, the gift and the call was always on my life. But I was at a place in time that, like you said, at that age back then, I don't want that church boy image. I don't want to be no preacher. I ain't doing all of that there. And I was like, man, listen, when I think about that, when I think, you know, it used to be a song in church, boy, and, and it gets you choked up. But when I think about, when I think of all the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, <laughs> you know what I mean? You you can't tell it like I can tell it. You know what I'm saying? Because I could do a whole series on shows of why I should not be alive at all right now. You know what I'm saying? So the fact that God will give me certain opportunity after opportunity after opportunity again, and I'll never forget, you know, real quick, I, um, I think I said it before on a previous show, but my personal thing came and I knew I knew I was called to preach, have ministry, and I was running from it. I wasn't trying to hear it. And this one particular day, I'm sitting there in, in my living room, and I have my little ritual, you know what I mean? I rolled me five L's the first thing in the morning because I don't like to keep rolling. You know what I mean? I don't want to smoke, then roll again. Smoke. Let me go ahead and roll five right now so I can just chill for a minute. Got my routine with my son. He was just born. I know how to play with him, put him to sleep. Then I'm going to just watch my, my shows and all that there. So this particular day, I had um, Nas, It Is Written, I had Biggie, Life After Death, and Jay-Z, Reasonable Doubts. Those were the only three CDs that I had in this six CD changer. And sat down, got in my chair, because I had my little special chair, sit back in my chair, Hit the hit the play button on the remote, and the you know what came on the first song because I had them on random so it mix them up. First song that came on was "No Weapon Formed Against Me South Prosper" by Fred Hammond. Wow, I'm like that CD ain't in it, and I'm a big Fred Hammond. I got everything Fred ever did, so I'm a big Fred Hammond fan. But I'm like that CD ain't in it, so I go over there, open it up, check them out again. Boom, go back on, make sure it say CD. Not radio, not FM, you know what I mean? <laughs> get back, light up again, same song come on again. D, I get up out the chair, I unplug it from the wall. I'm just not gonna listen to no music right now. You know what I mean? Real talk, this is a true story. I'm not gonna listen to no music. And as soon as about two minutes later, the song came on again. And I put my blunt out, and I remember having a conversation with God, just like I'm talking to you now. And I said, Lord, you know what? If you want my attention that bad that you're trying to speak to me, then I don't want to live for you. I don't have the desire to live for you. But I ask you, if you love me so much, you have that purpose for me, that you will give me the desire to want to live for you, that you will give me a desire to want to love you and do the things that you call me to do. And then when I say like my life, trend, it took a full spin within like two months. And it was like I was seeing the world different. It's like I always try to tell people. A real experience with God is like, like you say, the matrix. You know what I mean? It's like the red pill versus the blue pill. And it was like once my eyes was open to what really mattered the most, it was like, you know what? And it took, it still took me years to get out of that cell of just, you know what, being God, glad that God delivered me. You know what I mean? Not going to the next step of giving back. That's one reason I, I try to tell people now about the suicide attempt. Because people be like, I would never thought that you would. Nah, you ain't. You, you crazy. No, I'm a two-time loser when it came to suicide. You know what I mean? I failed every time I tried it. Luckily, my ex-wife at the time, on the third time, she saw me before I could even try. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, yeah. and was able to stop me. So I think I always tell people, I thank God that I was a failure in that aspect. But I tell people about that because, and, and, and about the drug game and about the street life and, and about the different things that I've been on, not being a, a good person at all. I tell all people that because, like you said earlier, you are not alone. And if God can do it for me, God has no respect to person. He can do the same exact thing for you if you allow him to. You know what I mean? So I think that that's real pivotal that, you know, I, I get sick and tired of church people. You know, they up there, they, they, they wear the nice suits and they happy and ecstatic for what God delivered them from. But they don't want to tell the people what it is that God delivered them from. You don't, they don't, you know what I mean? You don't want to look in that mirror. You don't want, you want to leave the past behind us. But we don't understand that it's healing 
if we would share that testimony sometime of what God brought us through and brought us out of, because there are people that's going through that think that, you know what, God can't use me because I'm a hoe. God can't use me because I'm a drug dealer. God can't use, no, God can use anybody that allows him to. And that's a beautiful thing that I love about God is that he takes the ordinary and makes them extraordinary. You know what I'm saying? You can't do that on your own. You know what I mean? You can't go from a 1.9 education to doing what you're doing now. You see what I'm saying? Without God, whether you acknowledge it or not, like we, we're nothing without him. So I think that's what the pandemic taught me first and foremost. And then on a natural sense, besides spirituality is, don't sweat the small stuff. The people that you love, let them know that you love them while you yeah. can. Yes. You know what I'm saying? While you can, like, and, and that was one of the things, you know, I, I, I got to the point where, you know, I would see people, like I said, I respect everybody's decision. You know what I mean? But I've seen so many people dying and people in my family, outside of my family, my friends, they losing lives. And I refused to be, I was like, listen, I'm never going to put myself in a position where I'm so scared of this COVID or anything else that if I want to see my mother, I'm not going to go see my mother and get a hug if I want to hug my mother. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm waiting for the pandemic to die down and I'm waiting for it to be safe again. And then, God forbid, my mom, I lose my mom during that time. And I can never hug her again. I can never yeah. tell her I love her again. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, no, make sure that you, you you let the people know that you rock with. Let them know that you rock with them, that you live for them. Because, like you said, man, life is just too short to be sweating the small stuff, man. And I think that's what I, I learned the, um, throughout, the, throughout the pandemic the most. Is the smell of roses while I still can. You know what I mean? I don't need nobody to give me a pat on the back. I pat myself on the back because, like yeah, I said, yeah, I remember yeah. where I came from. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't look at that as being prideful. I don't look at that as being braggadocious. I look at that as being humbly thankful to the God Almighty because I know it could have been it could have been a whole different story. It could have been a whole different story. You know what I mean? So I thank God for just the small things. I, I smell the roses. I thank God for the little things. I thank God for the important relationship that I, that He placed in my life and that was another process and I think that's one of the things that the pandemic told me the most was to embrace those relationships you know what I mean you know you got people sometimes that'll tell you yeah hey hey look bro you come talk to me you can holler at me anytime my phone is always on and a lot of times we won't reach out to them I learned how to embrace those relationships I'm gonna call you on it you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. if, you, if you tell me that your phone is always on I'm gonna check you on that when I'm going through something next time I'm gonna just call and see where your head space at if you give back to me and all that there to see if you really mean what you say and say what you mean. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if anything, the, the, the pandemic has taught me to love harder, to love more, and, and, and just to be be more open, to be more vulnerable. You know what I mean? That's one of the things that God gave me personally. I don't preach that to other people, but he said, I need you to be my transparent prophet during, during these days. And I was like, man. Like, God, I don't want to put myself on front street. I don't want to put all my business out there. But at the same time, I got to a place in God to where if, you, if that's what you're telling me to do it, I tell people all the time, and I got a saying that God won't bring you to something that he won't bring you through. You feel what I'm saying? So I've just learned, like, okay, it might be uncomfortable, but if uncomfortable is where you need me to be, then guess what? I could be uncomfortable because I'm not going to be uncomfortable by myself. I still got your presence with me. I still got your presence, you know what I mean? You there with me. So I have nothing to be afraid of anymore. I don't operate yeah. in fear no more. And that's what I was doing for so many years. I don't want people to look at me this way. I don't want people to see me this way. Mm -hmm. Where I'm supposed mm -hmm. to let God have his way and his will in my life. And now, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm an open book. I'm trying to help mm -hmm. everybody that I could possibly help, man. And that wasn't always yeah. my case. Your, um, your testimony just helped me, and it's going to help hundreds of people who get a chance to watch this, bro. That was very powerful. Don't sweat the small stuff. Um, you know, just really, it's all a blessing, man. Like everything you shared was, it, it moved me in a lot of ways. I, I appreciate your, your vulnerability, your transparency. Like that's what you were saying earlier. Like once you know somebody, if somebody's watching this right now who's going through some of the same struggles you went through, some of the same struggles that I went through, they understand that they're not alone, gives them more motivation to push forward. Absolutely. Effort. Um, next, in the next day, in the next hour, um, just to kind of continue to just be focused on um, life and purpose and value, you know, so it's really important. I'm glad you shared that, brother. That's extremely powerful. Thank you. Man, I appreciate it. Yeah. And to God be the glory, man. Like I say, 
I'm like that. I believe I believe the word. You know, if I can help somebody, yeah. and like I said, being in an uncomfortable situation, I'm not sharing things that I might necessarily want to share. But if it's gonna bring about a deliverance to somebody else, man, yeah. I gotta give all the glory to God. You know what I mean? And, yeah, and part of it too is if anybody's watching this struggle and seek help. Reach out to us. We might be able to tap into some resources for you. You are absolutely not alone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some very lonely journeys, but there's resources out there for you. Um, God is a resource. You know, of course, you know how Marvin is saying it, the primary resource. And I agree with that. Um, but don't feel like you're alone. Try to connect with those you know, um, believe that love you. Um, speak to God. You can do that at any time. Mm -hmm. um, and really try to understand your value and your purpose. Like to imagine, Marvin, think about the purpose you're living in now, man, in the world not being able to see all the great things you're doing now, man. So it's a blessing to be uh, sharing this opportunity with you and hoping folks can grow from our conversation. Definitely, man, definitely, man. I want to definitely have you back on, man. But before we go, man, I want to talk, talk about the book a little bit. I am, I will. Talk about the book. Yeah. What inspired um, the book and where can the people get get a copy from? So, you know, what's interesting. Um, the book was actually I've been trying to get this book off the ground. So the book that I tried to give Kanye was Words Travel, like an anthology of hip hop poetry that I put together. Not my best work. Um, so during the pandemic, I've been trying to get this book off the ground. I had the concepts I've been presenting on. I am my will throughout the country. And when we were on lockdown starting March, 2020, I was like, you know what? Let me just lock, let me lock in. So I locked in for six months, finally got the book off the ground. Um, I sell it. So, you know, it's a FUBU production for us, by us. I'm not trying to use no major distributor. I don't want to, you know, share the resources with these major corporations. Mm -hmm. um, so folks can contact me directly um, to purchase the book. We can ship an autographed copy to them as soon as possible. And what it does is it, it outlines um, multiple um, action achievement areas, 17 action achievement areas, and basically giving folks an opportunity to identify who they are as it relates to that particular area, who they want to be, and then outlining action steps. So it's actually a book that you can write in, and it really helps you lock into the areas of growth that you need to focus on as it relates to your purpose and moving forward. So the I am, anything you put after I am, no one can tell you that you are not. And again, we're not talking about societal definitions. I am a proud Haitian American. I am a proud father. I am a, a edutainer, right? Whatever you believe you are, you let the world know. And then the I will, what do you plan to become? It's personal and professional, right? I plan to be a better father, whatever it is. And then you're gonna outline time reference action steps to achieve those goals and really tapping in to the why power. So every goal you outline in here, you have to write down why. Okay. Like, why is it important to you? And if it's not important to you, then you're probably not going to lock in to get it done. But as I said earlier, why you want to stop eating sugar? Well, because, you know, diabetes runs in your family. Your family members have to lose limbs, you mm -hmm. know, because of because of their addiction to sugar. So you have to try to stop that cycle in this very moment, you know, and really lock it in. So this is just a very simple guide to help you do that. Marvin, I got to send you a copy. Um, yeah, how about now? You ain't got to send me a copy. I'm about to tell you when. Once we get off this here, I'm purchasing my copy at night. <laughs> you want to send me one, that's fine too, but I'm going to purchase yeah, it. I'm definitely I, believe, I believe in that, man. Like you say, it's not about these big corporations and they sending their kids off, their grandkids that never have to work a day in their life over the backpack in Europe and all that there. We got to learn how to support one another, man. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, your copy's in the mail, man. Just send me, a, send me your address and you get that. And it's cool really deal, man. Elevation Over Entertainment using tools and over toys, healing over harming, and just really locking into your purpose and your passion and just living accordingly, right? We all know what good decisions are. So we all have all the power of our destiny in our hands, literally. No doubt, no doubt, I don't care man. what your like past that. has been. I don't care what you've been through. At this moment, you can make the change right now in this very moment and change the trajectory of your life and your family's life. The power Absolutely. is Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Man, like I said, man, I thank you for doing this, man. I appreciate you, all you people that's out there. He's tagged in this feed. It's also on his page as well, Danny Jean. Um, reach out to him if you have any educational type questions about financing, what it is that you want to do, things that just anything that you have out there, reach out. I, I encourage you to reach out to him. And I'm quite sure if he don't have an answer for you, he can lead you in the right direction, man. And but like I said, man, I thank you for your time. I thank you for doing this. 
Did you have anything you wanted to share with the people before we leave? Nah, just Ephesians 4 and 29. Make sure the words that you share are to build and not destroy. Marvin, I appreciate this opportunity and this platform. We got to stay connected. Um, make sure the world knows about what you're doing and um, continue to network. And if anybody that's watching this, if I could be of any assistance to you in any way, form or fashion, you can reach out to me through my social media platforms, Danny Jean or at Words Travel on Twitter and LinkedIn. Got you, man. Appreciate you, bro. Know that I love you, man. I love everything that you're doing, man. Keep it up, bro. The people, yo, the, the young generation, where whether they listen or not, bro, they need you. You are you are a, a necessity. And I, I thank you, man, for walking in that boldness and actually putting your your best foot forward and doing it. So you guys support everything that he's doing. It's not this is his latest book. He does have other books, like he said earlier. Um, so you know, guys, reach out to him. We're gonna support one another and support Danny and everything that he's doing. Um, thank you again. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. And we're getting closer, y'all. I'm going to see y'all next next week for our um, for Freestyle Monday. I mean, Freestyle Tuesday, the first month. The first show of each month is just a freestyle where it's all about you guys. So whatever the questions that you guys present, whatever, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. And then the following will, week will be the one-year anniversary. So I'm looking forward to that, man. I thank you guys for taking this journey with me. I thank you guys for encouraging me. I thank you guys for viewing. Thank you guys for your time, man. I just thank you guys for the love and encouragement, man. I appreciate it. I take I take constructive criticism just like I take positive criticism. I'm here for it all because I, I ain't sharp as iron, and you can't hurt my feelings, <laughs> to be honest with you. So let it flow and let me know how you really feel, man, and things that you think that can make the show better and whatnot case may be as we move forward um, again. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Thank you, bro, man. Keep on doing what you're doing, man. And as usual, in signing off, DeAndre, have you born there again, bro. But DeAndre and Lyson, know that daddy loves you intentionally, and I also love you unconditionally. Till next week, peace.